Hi, welcome to Artistic Adventures. I'm Holly from BB Library, and today's artist is Helen Frankenthaler. And she was an abstract expressionist like Jackson Pollock because she expressed what she was feeling in her paintings rather than, than really putting exactly what she saw. But she was a little bit different. They, she met him and was very um, um, inspired by the work that he was doing. And the one thing that they definitely did like is that they worked on the floor. They put their canvases on the floor in what's called an unprepared canvas. So usually when artists paint, they will take and put a coat of paint to seal the canvas before they, they paint on it. Whereas both Pollock and, and Helen, they um, didn't do that. They just laid it on the floor just as it is. Now hers was different because she didn't splatter her paint the way that he did. But she did wet her. She started with a wet canvas with the whole idea that um, she wanted paint to kind of to kind of move and spread and she did things to control that. So she started with this wet canvas and then she dropped either, she started in oil paint and then went to acrylic, the oil paint that she would um, thin so it wasn't as thick. Um, she'd use, um, I think, turpentine to thin it. And so she would stop by, by literally pouring or dropping paint on and allowing it to spread. But to kind of control it, she would um, she would take things like paint brushes or she even used like a squeegee or um, uh, sponges to help control so the paint didn't go where she didn't want it. But she wanted colors to kind of touch and mix. And the other thing that she used, uh, we'll see one painting with that, is that she used charcoal because that line of charcoal on the paper actually would stop the, uh, on the canvas, would stop the paint from, uh, from going and blending with other colors. And the other thing um, with his, with his layers of thick paint, it was really a little bit 3D. If you go see it at the museum, you'll see that, that you can see the paint sticking up where it dried, whereas hers was flat, it wasn't 3D. One other thing about her that's different is, although they both were lived at the same time and they were doing the same sort of work, is that she was, um, was recognized during her time. At 24, she was recognized as being really a great upcoming artist, whereas Pollock, way, I think I've said before that a lot of artists don't get recognized until they're, they're really quite old or even dead, but Pollock in his 40s, late 40s, became recognized. So um, she called what she did, this technique that she did, she called it a color field, and other people started liked it and started using her idea. In fact, the book we're gonna read, um, is called Dancing Through Fields of Color, which I thought was a very clever, a clever way of talking about the color fields, that, that, the way she called it. Uh, she also got into doing um, word, woodcut printing. I don't know if anyone's ever done it in school or someplace where you've taken and um, either carved a, a, a picture into a, some soap or wax or um, linoleum but uh, she carved um, she carved into wood and then used that she painted under that and then used that to to print as well as she did lithographs which something i really have never understood i i know people who do lithographs but um from what i can see is you use either um, a block of limestone or marble and, or you can use metal and you're going to put onto that a drawing that is, is made using um, almost like a crayon. And the thing about the thing about it, you do that and it goes through a press. It's really complicated. I, I don't understand it. Go and look up lithograph and watch how they do it. They do it in several different ways, but it just seems that it's crazy. The thing about that is once they have made what they want to do, they can make as many copies of that as they can. So sometimes, you know, some fine artists would make um, a, a print, a lithograph is a print, and they will have numbered it like one of a hundred or one of 50 or one of 10. So they can make that exact same thing um, multiple times by doing that. So she did that, but she's especially known for absolutely the beauty and the color of her abstract work, which you usually those things don't go together in the same way. And also that just the color was kind of optimistic. A lot of the other abstract expressionists um, their works look um, chaotic or look 
angry or have darker colors. Not all. I, I think some of Pollock's are absolutely beautiful, but a lot of them are, are dark. And a lot of other people that were working at the time that were, you know, abstract expressionists. There are things, there's, um, she married um, a fellow artist um, that was also an abstract expressionist. His, lots of blacks and his do look, look, um, they don't look cheerful and, and colorful. Uh, her, her big inspiration were the colors of nature. So I think that it says that in the book. So let's get to our book. All right, so here we are. Uh, our book, let me get that so it's straight. book is Dancing Through Fields of Color, the story of Helen Frankenthaler. It's written by Elizabeth Brown, and I have to give real props to the illustrator Amy Sakuro. This is beautiful. It, it looks like her work so much. And it's all another one that's published by Abrams, who, as I think I said last time we had one of them, I, I know of as a, a company that prints mainly art books. So it's perfect. So Dancing Through Fields of Color. At a time when girls were taught to sit still, learn their manners, and color inside the lines, Helen Frankenthaler colored hers reds, blues, and yellows any way, which way she chose. Helen never wanted to follow the rules. When her mother called her to the dinner table, Helen continued painting watercolors of the sunset shining through the apartment window. Instead of going to bed, Helen filled the sink with water. She dribbled in drops of ruby red nail polish and watched the colors flow. When she let the water out, she loved to watch the colors swirl into shapes. Don't try that one at home. <laughs> I wouldn't be too happy at my house. During summer vacations, Helen let the waves whoosh and whirl around her, sailing her body through the tides. When her father called her ashore, she wanted to keep circling and twisting and floating, forever wrapped in the blue-green colors of the sea. When her older sisters were in school, Helen spent her days with her mother who nurtured her dreams. Helen read and wrote stories, made collages, and creating designs with glass beads, circles, hearts, and stars in brilliant colors. She painted pictures and cards for birthdays and anniversaries, filled with all the colors of happiness, purple, yellow, and pink. Helen's father worked long days as a judge. She couldn't wait for him to come home each day. He took her wherever she wanted to go. Most of all, Helen loved walking with her family in Central Park. She ran under the welcoming sky, twirling, waltzing, leaping across the lush fields and played hide and seek among the flowering trees. When it was time to go, Helen took the colored chalk she'd stuffed in her coat pockets and drew a line from the front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art through the park, across the street, through the cloud, crowds, around the corner and all the way home. Her colorful line connected the two things she loved most. Helen's parents always encouraged her to blossom, express herself, paint free. In art classes at school, Helen wanted to do, two, wanted to do things her way, but she had to follow the rules in order to pass. Don't sketch like that, draw like this, paint what you see. Helen pleased her teachers when she sketched figures, drew chairs, painted flowers and pears like all the other students. But she wished for something different. Helen found comfort in painting seascapes. The blues and greens reminded her of her summer days with her family at the beach. She made pictures of her trips to the country with bursts of orange gold paints that warmed her face like the sun. Soon Helen's happiness disappeared entirely. When she was 11, her father died. Helen missed him so much that her sadness caused pounding headaches. She struggled in school. Helen tried to paint, but nothing came out. Her canvases remained blank, her world of colors and light dark. But colors lived in her mind, floating and shifting like the shapes she made in childhood. Staring at every color in her paint box, memories came to her. Periwinkle, the feathery whisper of her father's encouragement. Ochre, 
this this is this is ochre here it's a color that's not all that familiar um, the warmth of her father's hand as they strolled in the country cobalt and crystal the summer splashing in the ocean waves Helen began to paint again and eventually art healed her Helen followed the rules well enough to succeed in school and go to college to study painting her professor wanted colors separate with thick black lines her brush marks and planes arranged across her canvas to create depth and space Helen loved college but no long but longed to paint what she felt inside painting feelings couldn't be contained in black lines or organized into clear shapes or objects Helen dreamed of setting her colors free like she was as a child running without boundaries she searched for more after college Helen moved back to New York where many artists were exploring forms lines and shapes differently they overlapped bands of color thought more about geometry and painted larger and larger pictures Helen met an artist named Jackson Pollock whose paintings hung in museums and galleries the art world called him the greatest living painter in the United States reviewers celebrated him fans loved him when Helen saw his work, she marveled how he splattered and dripped his paints on canvas tacked to his studio floor. If he broke the rules, why couldn't she? Helen exhibited her art in small shows while male paintings were given larger exhibits. Critics called Helen's works too sweet in color, too lyrical and ladylike. She worked harder and harder at her paintings, drawing strength from her memories of the country and sea. She wanted to leap into her colors, feel the colors, and be the colors. Art never let her down. Helen traveled to Nova Scotia to get away. As she walked through the fields, colors swirled around her. Cerulean blue and coral cascaded down mountains of saffron and gold. Rose, pink, and lavender rippled over across the sky. Spring green and vermilion gushed through the sea waves. Helen felt the countryside move within her body. She saw the mountains with her arms. She heard the sea in her wrists. Could she paint the beauty she saw all around her? Could color be the painting? Helen grew brave. Back home in New York, she laid down a huge canvas on the floor. She put down her brush. Helen blended red and yellow to make orange. Blues and yellows became green. She mixed and mixed and mixed rainbows. Helen swirled charcoal lines across her canvas to guide her like the chalk lines she drew as a girl in the city. With fistfuls of pink, Helen turned her wrist outward and spread the paint, streams of color racing and then spiraling, the paint soaking into the canvas like rain seeping into soil. Helen grabbed a bucket of crimson and poured, setting her colors free. They ran and rushed. Her colors turned into memories. Helen imagined the mountain peaks of Nova Scotia with her arms. She remembered the sea waves with her wrist. With a sweep of her arm, she splashed green like sea foam. Colors jeted across the painting, a jeté is just a jump, a ballet jump, merged and connected like rivers into oceans colors into feelings. Wherever the paint landed was the perfect place to be. Grabbing a nearby mop as her partner, Helen promenaded through puddles and pools of paints, pushing and pulling her colors together. Oranges and reds tangoed, corals pirouetted, pinks plied, yellow and blue sashayed, winding, turning, spinning. When she was done, Helen danced in that field, free among all the shimmering colors of her life, extending, reaching beyond the painting forever. In fact, this right here is when we see her paintings. This looks like it's part of her first painting. So here is, um, there, in, here, there's, in fact, here it is. This one's her first painting, but we're gonna look at it closer. It's called Mountains and Sea. Her first one that actually she did in that style that made a splash she used oil paintings and charcoal on it says on unsized that means it's unprimed it's not been pulled and put into a frame so um 
there we go. And here she is um, dancing. I think of all the books we've, we've read, I do think that this one really does the best job of kind of expressing and, and really showing the style of the painter, of the artist. So I really like this one. Um, and um, the BB Library owns it, so <laughs> I'm taking it back today. All right, we're going to get ready to um, look at some, some art. All right, I have some pictures to show you of Helen. First of all, here's one of her in her studio. It looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? It reminds me very much of when we looked at Jackson Pollock's studio. It's it just, just the paint all over and everything. I love it. So um, the, next, the next four pictures are um, looking at, I found some photographs of her working, looking at her, the process that she used. So first of all, she would, um, she'd put the canvas on the floor like Jackson Pollock did. And in her case, she would wet it. Um, to do her her color feel so then she would pour paint here's a picture of her pouring paint that had been either i'm not sure if this is acrylic or if it's um or if it is um oil she initially worked in oil and she would um put sometimes put the charcoal on the page first to kind of confine the way the paint moved but if it was um oil painting she would have used turpentine to thin it if it was acrylic she would have used water to thin it so she did that and then if you look at this she used some um, she's using it looks like um like one of those little temporary brushes that you sometimes use when you're painting at your house she used a brush or even a squeegee or a mop it said in there to help direct the paint the way she wanted it to go um and then she would use a smaller brush to um actually control finer make finer lines and then there were places in there that she would paint if necessary so those were kind of the four, the four, four of the steps that she used. So here's that first painting that she did with that technique that was inspired by a trip that she took to Nova Scotia, which is um, is a beautiful place with the sea and the the big sky and also the red soil. It's um, this is called Mountain and Sea. She made that in 1952, and it was, you know, like a first painting that that she did in that style that made quite a splash as i said she was you know in her 20s and um and uh was kind of looked at like ooh, you know she's, it, she's doing good um all right the next one's called the bay you probably recognize the same sort of color she likes those colors of um of the 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 mountains and the the um the landscape all nature um this one is the canyon totally different colors, but I think they're beautiful. She definitely is someone who I, I really, really like. Um, the next one is something called Nature Abhors a Vacuum. And now I've got a woodcut here. And this woodcut, um, she would have made, um, she would have had carved blocks of wood into the shapes that she wanted to, to print. And then she would have taken those and it printed, put, put paint onto the woodcuts and, and printed. This one is, um, is called Madam Butterfly. It's made of 46 woodcuts and it uses 102 colors. It's pretty amazing. Um, so it's it also, the, it's made on three pieces of paper that she made. So I also have, um, I found a picture of one of the woodcuts. So here is, here's one of those 46 woodcuts that she used for Madame Butterfly. So you can see what that looks like. And you can see that it's been all painted to do. Other thing with woodcuts, a lot like the lithographs, is that she could reproduce that pretty easily. She wouldn't be take, having to take and, and make everything. She had, you know, the, usually when you think of woodcuts, you think of really, like if, we, if, we're, if we're stamping, you know, there's shapes that we recognize. Like we're gonna stamp a tree, we're gonna stamp a, um, a dog or a cat. You know, our, ours, you know, are pretty thing, but what she wanted were these more abstract shapes. And then I've got two of her lithographs. I think they're beautiful. Um, the first one is called Solarium. This one is, uh, is a little more abstract. Uh, and number 10 is called um, Blue Current. I think they're very, they're very pretty, the colors in particular. When I look at her stuff, I think back to Mary Blair and how she had an unusual, you know, kind of, um, more vivid um in some ways i don't know it, it just um it, it appeals appeals to my aesthetic more than some of them 
some of the other abstract paints. Okay, so we're gonna do a work in her style. So let me just get that set up. All right, um, because I'm going to be getting everything wet, I did go get um, I did go get a lid, just a lid off of a off of a um, like a storage bin. Oh, now you can see see up above here. So I've just got I'm using also. I decided that I didn't really want to use um, just you know copy paper, which was which is what I normally use. So this is a this is a piece of um, just white um, construction paper. So I'm going to get this wet. And I'm going to I'm going to use um, I'm going to, I'm going to use watercolors. So there um, I decided not to use not to use acrylics or anything else. Um, this 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 will blend pretty well. Hmm, it's kind of shiny. I can see the shine through. I'm gonna try, let me just take, I'm gonna turn off, I hope we can still see. Let me turn off the light. What is the light like? Okay, let's just shine. All right. All right, so um, I'm just gonna take, um, take a color. I'll bring this over to the side. I'm just gonna take and get some, get some pretty wet. In fact, there's my first, my first little bit of blue over there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna drop some colors on this. I, I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm gonna just choose colors of things that I like. Or, or I'm, I'm doing more Pollock here, because I, I can't get it wet enough to let it, there we go. But it, like, like Pollock, it's, it's, um, you know, it's the idea of dropping on. And this is not going to have the, the texture at all. But the big difference that she made was was the addition of the addition of using um, using the the wet. I want that right there. I want that to go. I can't get it wet enough to get it to drop. Let me see. And if she wanted to get an area, uh, like a large area, she would pour. Now we really can't do that very well with this unless you have got, unless you're using um, a liquid paint. Um, I want this area. I'm gonna paint a little bit on because I would like, like a bigger, bigger patch, which she did too, so. yellow a little screen a little yellower Let's see if I can see if I can get that I've learned one thing I really do like doing abstract abstract work and I think that I'm going to buy a set of just blank cards and um, and do some painting on them that I can use as thank you cards or different things because I, I I actually something I've learned from this is how much I've liked that hmm, I can't get this can't get this yellowy yellowy enough for what I want I'll get this up closer so you can see can you see how the uh, the colors are are kind of branching up from where I put them. They're kind of following the, the water. They're following like the, the fibers of this. Let's see. we go. 
Or that right, right there. But you get the idea. This is actually, as I said, very fun and relaxing. I don't, don't want to bore people by you watching me hours just kind of getting putting paint on a wet piece of paper. But I think this is, I think mine is, it's kind of a masterpiece. I like it. <laughs> but I think that is what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to buy some blank cards and, um, and play around with play around with doing some wetting them and playing around with this because it's um this this appeals appeals to my sensibilities and I'm gonna mix those two together a little bit I think I'm just gonna stick with those colors but I'm gonna change that blue to something that's there we go something in between She married um, Robert Motherwell, who was um, also an abstract um, artist and an abstract expressionist, and um, his works are, are pretty interesting. But the one thing about them, they were called by everybody in the art world the golden couple, because unlike most artists who came, just came from ordinary families and, um, and really had to work hard to, you know, to make a living in art, until they until they were discovered, uh, both uh, Motherwell and uh, Frankenthaler they both came from wealthy parents, and in some ways that um, people called them the golden couple, and that wasn't necessarily met in in this, a super nice way. In some ways, they, I think they were a little bit jealous of the fact that they were not totally dependent on selling their works or or doing you know, having to do tons and tons of exhibitions. They could spend time working because they they were not as dependent as a lot of the other artists on, um, on having to make all their money from their their artwork. Well, I'm happy with that, but I'm, I also, I don't like the fact that, that it looks a little bit, a little bit too pollocky. So I'm gonna find my spray bottle, there it is. And I'm going to give it a spray, and that ought to make them run together a bit more. There we go. Yeah. Oh, that's better. So try this. You know, just have some fun. Find a piece of just a piece of white paper, and um, I was. So that's how it is looking now, and I'm sure these will all run together a whole lot more. And I'm going to let it dry before I take it off of <laughs> off of this. It may take a while. It's pretty wet, and I will be right back with you. Okay, well, have fun doing some work using the color field process that uh, Helen Frankenthaler did. But um, I hate to say this is the last of my artistic adventures. I'll be starting at this time on Tuesdays at 4 o'clock. I'll be starting something new. I'm not sure what it is yet. I'm trying to come up with an idea. I have liked the art, but um, it's time to move on. I, I, done all of my favorite books. I know there must be more, but I couldn't find any more that I thought I could continue a whole series. So trying to come up with something else. It'll be a, be a creative something we do, whatever it is. <laughs> but from this, I want to go through the artists that we've done, like Ruth Goldberg, from him, we, who's crazy complicated cartoons of machines doing just very simple tasks. They kind of showed us the power of imagination. And, and with Henri Matisse, the great impressionist painter, who showed that creativity has no age because when he was not able to stand and paint, he took to his bed and made some gorgeous paper cuts. And Edwin Binney, our only non-artist, but he invented the art supply that probably has propelled a lot of young artists um, to working on their creativity, the Crayola, Crayola Crayon. We looked at Basia Kandinsky, um, our, our first abstract artist who painted what he heard, not what he saw, that was different, and Mary Blair who gave a style and a beautiful bright colors to the Disney films. We looked at Yayoi Kusama who was dotty about dots and she wanted all of us to experience the feeling of affinity by making her these magical rooms of mirrors. Uh, Keith Haring, he, the iconic street, street artist who encouraged everybody to draw because we all need a little art in our lives. And Jackson Pollock, 
uh, the abstract expressionist who kind of flung his emotions onto the canvas with layers and layers of paint. Alexander Calder, the artist and sculptor whose mobiles were perfectly balanced and his colors were very basic. And Andy Warhol, who put the popular culture into the pop art scene. He had us sing double and triples and even more. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, who brought us up close and personal to flowers and showed us the flavor of the Southwest that she loved so much. Uh, Ramiri Bearden, who celebrated his Southern heritage and his chosen home Harlem using um, collages of, of anything at all that he could find. And um, last week, Jean-Michel Basquiat, who showed us that our art doesn't need to be doesn't need to be neat and clean and perfect, colored within the lines. It just needs to be impactful to be something that's worth doing. And, and this week, Helen Frankenthaler, who created a new form of painting uh, and that used her, her keen eye of, and color to make her works into something special. Now, this is important. You are an artist and you need to create. So keep it up, keep drawing, keep painting, keep experimenting. Maybe someday someone will be talking about you and, and what new form you created. Um, try these new ideas, try new technologies. They may seem strange at first, but who knows? Who would have thought that that wedding canvas and pouring paint on it could make something so beautiful? Go to museums when you can. <laughs> now is probably not the best time. Or visit them online. You can be inspired, you can be amused. There's a lot of hilarious art. And you can just be absolutely amazed by what people are doing. And my um, my last tip is give the gift of your art to your friends and your family. Like I was saying, I'm going to make my own cards. I really want to do that. Make cards. You know, just if you have to make a birth birthday card for a friend or a family member, make them. Believe me, anybody who's made me a card, I've saved. Some of the others, not so much. Use your artwork as wrapping papers. So just take a big sheet and just do something with it. Wrap your presents with it. Um, and just give art to a special person. I want to show you one thing. This is something that my daughter made in for 2015. It's um, it's a calendar that's that it's made out of um, of an old CD case. The, the pieces to them kind of they sit in the calendar. This calendar sits in there. But what she did, this, these won't make any sense to you, but we have kept this. And we use it every year, even though the dates don't match up whatsoever. These are all pictures that mean something to our family. So it's hard to explain, <laughs> but they're, they're like family in jokes. Um, they all of them. We just we just really we just really love these. And she did this, um, you know, like five years ago. And these are all things that that are funny to our family and nobody else. Um, I'll tell you this one. My husband once went into a into a restaurant and the the legs of the chair were crooked so he put his wallet under under it to balance it and then went home and forgot the wallet so that's what <laughs> what that is so these are just all things that um that for our family just just are just funny funny things that in our family and this meant so much more if she'd gone out and bought us a calendar of the most beautiful paintings in the world we would have pitched it at the end of the year we're still using this one now, almost, almost six years later. In fact, it would have been six years later. You know, five, five years later, sorry. No, six years later. <laughs> um, so it's um, make something. Make a gift for somebody. And I can guarantee your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, your grandmother, grandfather, aunts and uncles, your friends, will all do that. I've saved every birthday card someone made for me. And... Uh, it's special. They took the t you took the time. You're using your creativity, and it means something. So, well, thank you for watching. And um, as I said, I'm sad to say that this is the last of the artistic adventures, but check in. Um, I, I'll come up with an idea soon. I, I like being creative. And um, it'll be on the calendar that, that you can take a look at. All right, well, thank you very much. Bye-bye, and have a very happy new year.